Welcome to the weekly chapel service of Fire School of Ministry. And today we have a special event, a debate between Dr. Michael Lewis Brown and Michael J. Sullivan. Would you welcome our two guests tonight? The subject of our debate is going to be Did Tongues, Prophecy, and Knowledge Cease in AD 70? And both debaters are in agreement that the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues and the other miraculous gifts of the Spirit mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 12, would cease when, quote, that which is perfect, unquote, comes. Uh, Mr. Sullivan claims that this was fulfilled in AD 70 when the soon second coming of the Lord took place. Dr. Brown claims that the second coming of Jesus has not yet come to pass, and that will be the point of contention for tonight's debate. The uh, format will be a 23-minute opening presentation. That will be followed by a 12-minute rebuttal. And then they will cross-examine each other for seven minutes. Uh, there is a potential that could extend to 10 minutes. And then there will be a five-minute closing statement. And after that, we'll have a brief period where you can ask questions uh, of our debaters. And we, uh, we want to make sure that each debater gets asked an equal number of questions. So. Uh, they should be directed towards uh, each of the two participants to keep that in mind as you're thinking about your questions. We're going to begin with uh, Michael Sullivan. He's going to be the first one to present. We'll have the timer in the front row, and uh, we will uh, allow 23 minutes for the opening statement. And uh, Mr. Sullivan, you're up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown, for accepting my debate challenge to you. Thank you for coming out tonight, even though it's very cold. And thank you online for tuning in this evening. This is a very important debate. I believe it's caused a great division in the body of Christ. And I come to you humbly tonight, giving you my perspective on it, which is obviously a lot different than I think you would hear in most of those books, four different views on the gifts. I'm going to jump right in because time is limited. Let's talk about the purpose of revelatory prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. Do we have my first slide up there? In Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7, predicted the messianic spiritual kingdom that would replace the fourth and earthly kingdom consider, consisting of iron, that is Rome, and clay, fleshly Israel who had joined together to persecute the believing remnant in Israel's last days. The Messianic kingdom, according to Isaiah, would be a new thing, that is Paul's mystery, that would be springing up in their midst when Messiah would recapitulate and fulfill all of Israel's promises through his body, the church, described as a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual Israel of God, a spiritual seed, a spiritual new Jerusalem, a spiritual temple, a spiritual priesthood of the Levites, a spiritual new creation, etc. Even though the Old Testament prophets predicted the Messianic last days generation would be in Peter's time, as Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, the New Testament apostles and prophets were still looking into them as an enigma or a dark mirror, seeing how they were to be fulfilled in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, and through his church, the body, in order to prove and develop Yeshua's spiritual fulfillment of the Old Testament promise, prophecies, the New Testament hermeneutic was spiritual, so there needed to be confirmation of this. So you had Yeshua doing signs to prove that he was the spiritual fulfillment of all of Israel's promises, and he extended that miraculous gift to his apostles and prophets. Charismatic Dr. D.A. Carson, you see the chart up there, he agrees with me that these two passages are parallel and, they just, and they're covering the already and not yet between this age and the age to come. The problem with this scenario is that he takes this age as the new covenant age and the age to come as the world history. When the Jew during the first century would never understand it that way. This age was the old covenant age 
And the age about to come was the new covenant messianic age. Argument number one, major premise. Both 1 Corinthians 13 and 2 Corinthians 3 describe an eschatological already and not yet process between this age and the age about to come. The second coming, that is that which is perfect, brings an end to this process and the three gifts. Minor premise. But this age is the old covenant age and the new covenant age. Age to come is the new covenant age that would soon vanish according to Hebrews 8.13 at the soon coming of Christ or when he would come in a very little while and would not delay. Conclusion, therefore, the miraculous gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge passed away when the glory of the old covenant, this age, passed away and the increasing maturing of the new covenant came in AD 70. Objective in my approach, if I can prove from the scriptures that Christ and the inspired apostles prophesied a first century second appearing of Christ. And if I can appeal to Dr. Brown, Brown's sources of authority in his book, Authentic Fire, I can hopefully persuade you. Let's jump into the big three. These are the three passages that theologians appeal to, liberal skeptics, Jews that Dr. Brown debates, uh, Bart Ehrman, they would say, look, Jesus promised that he would return in the first century. It didn't happen. The world didn't end. Therefore, Jesus is... Is not God like he claimed and the inspired apostles can't be inspired because they fail. The problem is, <clears throat> Bart Ehrman has the same error I believe my brother has. They both think that when Jesus' the second coming is to be fulfilled, it ends world history. Physical corpses fly up uh, out of the ground. So Bart Ehrman says, well, look, we have suffering and pain around here. It didn't happen. Throw the Bible away. Dr. Brown's approach wants to honor Christ, but he postpones all those things. Even though Jesus says, when the kingdom of God comes, you won't be able to say, see here or see there, for the kingdom of God is within you. And even though in Isaiah 65 and 66, in Revelation 21 and 22, it says that there's going to be evangelism in the new creation. There's going to be birth. There's going to be sinners. There's going to be evangelization. It's outside the gates of the new Jerusalem is where darkness is. It's not going to be completely eliminated. Look at the sources of authority for Dr. Brown. Apostle C. Peter Wagner, he's an apostle, so we better listen to him. He taught that the last days, the end times mentioned in the New Testament was referring to the end of the Old Covenant in AD 70. Well, if this is true, there goes the charismatic argument in Acts 2. What about Dr. Uh, or D.A. Carson and Sam Storms? They teach in Matthew 24 that the, the Son of Man coming on the clouds is a spiritual coming. They say that you can perceive and know and see that Christ had come because the Roman armies came in judgment. Now, that's exactly how God had come in the Old Testament. So they're using Scripture to interpret Scripture, and they honor the fact that Jesus said it would be filled in his generation. But there are some problems with that. But Dr. Brown says that, that's, that which is perfect. These guys say it happened in AD 70. I agree. It forms my position. What about N.T. Wright? Actually, Sam Storms also says that in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, talking about the heaven and earth passing away, he says that's the old covenant and the temple. I agree with him. I absolutely agree with him. That forms my position because in Revelation, when heaven and earth passes away, that's when we see God face to face at his soon second coming. I couldn't agree more. N.T. Wright is a source of authority in Dr. Brown's book. He's a continuationist, not the charismatic maybe that he is, but he argues that Paul, when he uses this age, and Jesus, when he says this age, it's the old covenant age. And the age to come is the new covenant age. He holds my position. He even says that in Matthew 13, Matthew 24, and Hebrews 9. That's the second coming passage. He says it was fulfilled in AD 70 at, at the parousia of Christ. He just gave away the farm. Now, Dr. Brown talks about a lot of uh, Jewish traditions during the time of Jesus, but what about the tradition that said, when Messiah comes, he's going to usher in a second Exodus generation. And between our old covenant age and our new covenant age, there's going to be a transition generation and Messiah is going to reign for 40 years. That fits perfectly with Jesus's paradigm in the New Testament and the inspired apostles. Let's get into our three texts. The first one, Matthew 10. D.A. Carson said, well, it says, uh, but he who endures to the end, the end of what? The end of the age, will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, not us, 
You will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. D.A. Carson, the charismatic, says of this verse, the coming of the Son of Man here refers to the coming in judgment against the Jews, culminating in the sack of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Couldn't agree more. The next big, uh, the second of the big three, Matthew 16, 27, 28. For the Son of Man in the Greek is mellow. Young's literal picks this up. For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, then he reward each according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there are certain of you standing here who will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Point number one, that phrase, verily I say unto you, everywhere it's used. It's, an, it's a statement of emphasis. And he's tying these verses together. In verse 27, he says, I'm about to come. In verse 28, he's tying them together. It's, some of, it's going to be so close that some of you are going to live to witness it. Dr. Brown takes the transfiguration. That Maybe we can talk about that later. The third is Matthew 24, verse 34. It starts off the Olivet Discourse. They want to know, Lord, when's the temple going to be destroyed? And give us some signs of your coming and the end of the age. How does he, how does he answer it? In Luke, when you see Jerusalem being, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that this desolation of Daniel 9 and Daniel 12 is near. Then let those who are in Judah flee. He says this will be in fulfillment of all that is written in the Old Testament. Then he answers it again in verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. He doesn't say some of these things. He says all of these things. What? The things he just got talking about. The end of the age, the old covenant age that's connected to the destruction of the temple. The end of the new covenant age isn't associated with the destruction of the temple. That's read into the context. The signs and his coming. Those are the things. So how do we interpret this generation? Dr. Brown in his books, he admits that normally it means the contemporaries of Jesus. And he even says in a footnote, yeah, some people say Christ came spiritually in the judgment on the clouds in AD 70. That's not the view he holds, but he acknowledges that it's a view. Um, charismatic Craig Keener in his book that he, that he wrote in, in Dr. Brown's book, but in his Matthew commentary, he says, this generation is consistently refers to the time frame of a single generation. He says it's artificial to say that this, gener this generation means the humanity of people, the Jewish race, or some end times wicked people. He said that's all artificial and is based on the need to try and protect Jesus from error. He says this generation is Jesus' contemporaries, and it's the climactic generation. I like that. Now, as you can see, Matthew 10 and Matthew 16 are little snapshots, and it's going to be developed in the Olivet Discourse. Look at the parallels. They're going to be delivered up to local councils and synagogues and flogged. They're going to be brought before governors and kings and the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit would be given to them miraculously to preach the gospel during this time. When the Son of Man comes, all the, the persecution has to take place first. So it's not the transfiguration. It's not Christ coming in, in Pentecost or the resurrection. It, there has to be some time that goes by. Look at the other parallels. Talk about the end. The end of what? The end of the old covenant age. Uh, the Great Commission, one is focusing on the land of Israel, one's on the Roman Empire. Christ comes in glory, Christ comes in glory. Christ comes with angels, Christ comes with angels. Christ comes in judgment, Christ comes in judgment. Christ and the kingdom come together at the same time in their generation. And in Luke 17, he says, when it comes, when the Son of Man is revealed, it will be within you. I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. Matthew 21. How's this going to happen? Well, for the, the remnant, it's going to be set up in your hearts. But for you Pharisees, you're going to be like a dead body and the vultures are going to come and pick you apart. That's how the kingdom of God comes. That's not in the already. That's in the not yet. That is coming. Argument number two. Major premise. The coming of the Son of Man in judgment with angels on the clouds before the end of the age in, this, in these passages is the one and only second coming and resurrection event. That which is perfect. Brown and I agree. Minor premise. But... Yeshua promised that his coming 
in these passages would occur in the lifetime and generation of those standing there. Conclusion, therefore the arrival of that which is perfect was fulfilled in AD 70, and tongues, prophecy, and knowledge ceased at that time. <clears throat> you may be familiar with this formula, axiom. If A equals B and B equals C, and A equals C, two or more things that are equal to another thing is also equal to each other. A equals B, B equals C. Imagine that Matthew 24 is A, B is 1 Thessalonians 4, and C is 1 Corinthians 15. But we have partial preterist charismatics telling us that Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 8070, that which is perfect. We even have N.T. Wright saying that the rapture is figurative language. Being caught up in the clouds and in the air is not to be taken physically. I agree. Look, if A, the Olivet Discourse, is equal to B, look at these parallels. It's like if you're a pre-trib rapturist, you hate this chart. If you're a partial preterist, you hate this chart. But if you're like Michael Brown and myself, you actually love this chart. We're just arguing it from completely opposite directions. But clearly, if one is a spiritual trumpet, one's a spiritual cloud coming, one's a spiritual voice of an archangel, you can't go to Thessalonians and say these are all physical if they're the same event. event. Then, of course, B equals C. 1 Thessalonians 4 equals 1 Corinthians 15. No one disagrees. Now, if my opponent brings up 1 Corinthians 15, please keep this chart in your minds. Moving from the clear to maybe the more unclear, difficult language. Clearly, it's the same parousia. It's the same gathering or change. It's the same trumpet. It's the same teleos, goal. It's the same kingdom that's consummated or fulfilled. All prophecy would be fulfilled. This is when the old covenant, the law, would be overcome, the sting of sin and death. And then it's the same contemporary audience. Jesus told you, and in this generation, Paul says we, some of us, are going to be alive to witness this. Paul isn't affirming 100% that he's going to be alive. He's just saying some of us are going to experience this. Was Paul inspired when he said that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus is the faithful and true witness in Revelation. And when he said he was going to come soon and in that generation, he did. Now, two or more things that are equal to another thing are also equal to each other. That is A equals B equals C. Here you can clearly see Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 1 Corinthians 15 are all the same events. The parousia, the trumpet, the dead are raised, and the living are changed, gathered, or caught up. Just different words communicating the same thing. Argument number three, major premise, the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 1 Corinthians 15, is the one and the same coming of Christ, that which is perfect. Minor premise, but the coming of Christ on the clouds in Matthew 24 was apocalyptic language, was spiritual. This is what my charismatic partial predators brethren tell me. Carson, Storms, Wagner, N.T. Wright. And even the catching away in the air and the clouds of 1 Thessalonians 4 is apocalyptic language. N.T. Wright. He's a scholar that Dr. Brown tells us we need to listen to. Conclusion, therefore, the one and the same non-literal trumpet sounding second coming event of Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 1 Corinthians 15 was that which is perfect and came in AD 70. How about the Great Commission? Great Commission. Only the, all right, here are some parallels between the Olive Discourse and Acts 1, 1 through 3. Only the Father knows the day and the hour. Only the Father knows and has the authority to give the time and dates. The Holy Spirit is given to fulfill the Great Commission. Same thing in Acts. Jesus would come from heaven upon, upon his glory cloud in their generation. Peter preaches the same thing. Be saved from this perverse and crooked generation of Deuteronomy 32 which is the last day's perverse generation. It's the climactic generation that Keener, I believe, was talking about. Now, look, the Great Commission was fulfilled by 87. Sam Storms, a contributing author in your book, Dr. Brown, goes to Matthew 24, 14, and he says, you got to go to Romans 10, 18, where Paul says, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth. Greek word, ye. 
and their words to the ends of the world, oikimene. So he goes, look, oikimene, Matthew 24, 14, oikimene in, in Romans. Well, what about ye? It's used there too. It's referring to the local uh, land of the Roman Empire, the world as they knew it. That's a proper definition for both of these words, oikimene and ye. Thank you. Look, you also have four Pentecosts in the book of Acts. You don't just have one. Why was the Spirit poured out on each people group? To show that the body of Christ is one. That needed 40 years to mature. 30 years into the church, and they still were treating Gentiles like dirt. The Holy Spirit, it took time. So you have, based upon the Great Commission of 1-8, you have in Acts 2, you have Jerus- you have Jews from Jerusalem, from every nation under the heaven. That wasn't the globe. It was the Roman Empire. That's the great commission that would be fulfilled in Jesus' generation. Acts 8, Samaritans, god fears, Gentiles, every people group. How about tongues in the great commission? Argument. This is the same great commission in all of it discourse in Acts 1.8. And they're both fulfilled by Paul's declaration in Romans 10.18. Major premise. It's the same same great commission. Minor premise, it was fulfilled in AD 70. Conclusion, the great commission was a sign before Christ came. It was a sign that was fulfilled. Dr. Brown, in one of his lectures, said, I'm going to fix a problem that you guys don't even know you had. And he was preaching out of Jeremiah 23, I believe. I'm going to humbly use that line. I kind of liked it. When Brown is talking about the 70 weeks, And Dr. Brown, help me with this, because it seems like out of one side of your mouth, you're saying that it was all fulfilled in AD 70, the 70 weeks. There can't be any large gaps in the chronology. Out of the other side of your mouth, you seem to throw it under the bus as the already and not yet. So there's a gap or there's not a gap, or we've redefined a gap into the already not yet. This is how I solve it, and I've got three minutes to do it. And this is beautiful. The Jews expected Messiah to come in a literal 490 years from the destruction of the first temple to AD 70. They were expecting Messiah to come somewhere between AD 17 and AD 28. Jesus shows up in Luke 4. He opens up the scroll of Isaiah 61, the promise of the Jubilee. He says this has been fulfilled. But look at point number three. They were expecting Messiah to do three things or four things. Day of Atonement gather his people to himself, and then do the days of vengeance in which he would judge the watchers and Satan. He had to accomplish everything within that generation, not just half a building or the first story, as Dr. Brown might use in an illustration. And now look at this chart. Please get that chart up there because I worked really hard on that. All right. Messiah had to come at the 10th Jubilee, all right? That 10th Jubilee, look where it lands, AD 26. That's where Jesus opens up the scroll of Isaiah 61. He fulfills all the feast days, not just a few, uh, four of them. And he ushers in the second exodus, that generation. And that's the already and not yet of New Testament eschatology. And Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. He wasn't to come and just fulfill the first coming before that 10th cycle of of the Jubilee. The Jubilee lasted 49 to 50 years. He had that much time to come in vengeance. And what does he say in Luke 21? These are the days of vengeance, which all that is written in the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, will be fulfilled. When, Jesus, in this generation, when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, that's when. And we know that when Rome surrounded the Christians, next slide, please, that, thank you, we know that when Rome surrounded Jerusalem, that there was a time where they retreated. And when they retreated, the Christians, remembering Jesus' words, left the city and they fled to Pella. And when they went to Pella, they were safe. Now, again, look, between AD 26 and AD 67 is a generation. He's fulfilling the Jubilee. He's fulfilling all of the Jubilee. And it's fulfilled spiritually in us 
Christ in you is the hope of glory. His presence is the hope of glory. That's the glory of the temple of Haggai 2 that is more glorious than any temple that can be. Not a third rebuilt temple, not some physical rebuilt temple in the millennium with animal sacrifices. Can you imagine Christ smelling the aroma of animal sacrifice? That's where your literal hermeneutic lands you. Time. Thank you, brother. Sure, bro. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. And uh, Dr. Brown, now you have your 23 minutes. Thanks, Michael, for your presentation. And as you have persistently challenged me to debate, glad that we have the opportunity to do it. I'll clean up a lot of the misstatements and errors during the rebuttal. But if your head's spinning, don't worry about it. It's really, really simple. The fact we're having this debate tonight means Jesus has not yet returned. So we can settle that quick. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, of course, our key text. Paul says that when the perfect comes, that which is complete and perfect, at that point, we'll know, even as we are known, we'll see face to face, the fact we're having debates, the fact that we've not all come in the unity of faith, of course, Jesus has not yet returned. Now, of course, if Michael is correct and Jesus returned in the year 70 and that would fulfill what was written in 1 Corinthians 13, then the gifts would have ceased. Prophecy would have ceased. Tongues would have ceased. The Holy Spirit didn't get the memo, just to let you know. So just some church testimony. For example, uh, Justin Martyr. Dialogue with Trifle, written around A.D. 160. Uh, he said, for the prophetical gifts remain with us even to the present time. Or Irenaeus, writing in around 180. For some of you certainly and truly drive out devils, so that those who have thus been cleansed from evil spirits frequently both believe and join themselves to the church. Others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and other prophetic expressions. Others still heal the sick by laying their hands upon them. They're made whole. The moreover, as I've said, the dead even have been raised up and remained among us for many years. We do also hear many brethren in the church who possess prophetic gifts and who through the Spirit speak all kinds of languages. That's only grade 350. And I'm just giving you a sample. Uh, the Spirit enlightens all, inspires prophets, gives wisdom to lawmakers, consecrates priests, empowers kings, perfects the just, exalts the prudent, is active in gifts of healing, gives life to the dead, frees those in bondages, uh, turns foreigners into adopted sons. And of course, around the world to this day, there are hundreds of millions of people who speak in tongues, and many who operate prophetically, including people sitting right here. Uh, Craig Keener in his magnum opus on miracles, two volumes, has estimated at least 200 million people are eyewitnesses of miracles today. Of course, the Holy Spirit continues to move in miraculous ways. But the real issue is not what this scholar says or that scholar says, the issue is what the scriptures say. And it's really forthright, it's really simple, it's really clear. Uh, the Lord commands us in scripture, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 39 and 40, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. Nothing in scripture overrules that, nothing in scripture takes that away. That's a command from the Lord. Earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. He gives us an example in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 of what our meetings should look like. Nothing in the New Testament rescinds this or comes against this or cancels this. We're sola scriptura. We're not like the Mormons who have an extra book or Catholics who have other traditions. We base our faith in what scripture says. This is how our meetings are to go. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If Michael's position was correct, that would mean that Paul's instructions to the Corinthians written in the mid-50s only applied for about 15 years, and then the end came, and none of this had any relevance for the rest of church history, and nobody bothered to tell us that it's in the Bible for no good reason. How fascinating. In fact, by the time most people even read it, it was abolished. It had no meaning. Fascinating. And again, who countermand, who overruled Scripture? And notice the way Paul classifies how things are set in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. 
Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. They are utterly and completely intertwined. You can't separate one from the other. And if you want to take out the miraculous ones, then how is it there before teachers, after teachers? All these things are intertwined. Why? Because it's the same God working in the same way. Based on cessationist interpretation on the entire list, the only thing that remains in the body is, is teachers. Wild. But, but the big issue is this. The claim that Jesus came in, in 70 AD and that all prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD, and that there will be no future resurrection. Ironically, virtually every person that Michael quoted during his presentation doesn't agree with that, rejects the position. And even if they agree with certain points, reject the overall thing. And not only so, throughout entire church history, no one has agreed with the position in terms of major church leaders, even across all the differences, that there will be no future resurrection of the dead or no future second coming. And we'll see that as we get to the end. So, very simply, it's absolutely ludicrous, completely unbiblical, and against all testimony through church history to argue that Jesus returned in 70 AD and that all biblical prophecies have already come to pass. We do not yet have perfect knowledge. We have not come into the complete unity of the faith. We have not received our resurrected bodies. Sorry, that's the truth. We do not see God face to face or know him the way he knows us. The wicked have not yet been destroyed. We are not living in the new heaven and new earth. The wolf is not lying down with the lamb. Swords have not been beaten into plowshares. Sorrow and sighing and tears and death and disease are still here. Satan is still deceiving and destroying. The dead have not yet been finally judged. Of course, Jesus has not yet returned. And of course, all prophecy has not been fulfilled. By the way, you might want to tell the baby starving to death in Africa that Jesus has already returned and we're living in eternal paradise. You may want to tell the children in the cancer work. You may want to tell the families who lost loved ones in the California fires or some of the recent mass shootings. And you may want to tell the victims of Muslim terrorists that Jesus has already returned and we're living in the days of universal peace that the prophets so clearly describe. The very thought of this is obscene. Have you? Let's, let's do a survey. Everyone watching on Facebook, have you received your perfect, eternal, sin-free, resurrected bodies yet? Have all wars and conflicts ceased? Has every last people who have heard the gospel, has Israel been saved? Has the whole world seen the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven? A thousand, a million times, no. I mean, honestly, we might as well debate whether Martians have taken over the human race or whether giraffes are actually elephants. That, that's more of a debate than the question of, did Jesus already return? And, and when we look back, at the first coming of Jesus, we see that it was literal, in keeping with the Old Testament prophecies. Acts 1 says this, as they were staring into the sky while Jesus was going, suddenly, so as Jesus was ascending, suddenly two men in white clothing stood near them and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him go to heaven. Has that happened yet? No. Simple. We don't need charts. We don't need all kinds of postulates. It is as simple and big as the nose on my face, which is pretty simple and big. <laughs> Let's also note that Paul and the early believers were not longing for the destruction of Jerusalem. They were longing for the Lord's return. Philippians 3, 20 and 21, that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Literal, physical resurrection. To deny this is to deny scripture, plain and simple. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. John wrote, 1 John 3, 2, we know 
that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. They were already born again believers. They were already indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but there was something yet to happen. People were not transformed into this new nature, received new resurrected bodies, and became like Jesus in that sense with the destruction of Jerusalem. No, of course not. Paul described the second coming, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 10, as this. He said, it is the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels taking vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength in that day when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be admired by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. So he's coming with his saints at this point. And Paul notes that this is when persecuted believers will receive rest and relief. Thessalonians did not have persecution ceased when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Other believers persecuted in the ancient world didn't receive relief at that point. And believers through the ages have not received relief since the temple was destroyed. That's because Jesus has not yet come back as prophesied, as spoken of by Paul. Again, very, very simple. And how, for that matter, did God bruise Satan under our feet, Romans 16, 20? How did that happen in AD 70? Zero connection between the two. And how did Paul describe this? Just just plain, simple, if you can read Greek fluently, wonderfully, but any English translation says it clearly, indisputably, 1 Corinthians 15, what's going to happen? We will not all sleep, meaning die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the blinking of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, literal, physical resurrection transformation. And this mortal body must find immortality. The fact that hundreds of millions of believers have physically died since 70 AD, the fact that our own bodies are not yet immortal, and the fact that the dead in Christ have not been physically raised is all the proof we need that Jesus has not yet returned. And Daniel does tell us in Daniel 12, 1 and 2, there will be a literal resurrection out of the dust of the earth. Let's also remember that Paul taught that before Jesus returned, the lawless one, meaning the Antichrist, will be revealed. He says, the Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one, he said, is based on Satan's working with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. That has not happened. That, that final end-time ruler has not been revealed with all kinds of counterfeit miracles and then destroyed by the Lord. And, and Peter tells us what's going to happen. To claim that these verses already happened is to deny reality. Again, you might as well argue that giraffes are elephants. You have a better argument for that. Look at what he says. 2 Peter 3. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved. And the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. The heavens will be on fire and be dissolved because of it, and the elements will melt with heat. Based on his promise, we wait for the new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. No possible way under the sun, in fairness to the words of Peter, that you could apply that to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. And then Jesus... Speaking first about natural and spiritual life, he says that those who hear his voice in John 5 will receive eternal life. And then he says this, John 5, 28 and 29, that a time is coming, not just for those who receive spiritual life, but when all who are in the graves, physically dead, will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of judgment. That has not happened yet. Again, it's a shame we even need to debate that. And if you believe the dead have already been raised, where are all the saints of old? Where are they? We're supposed to be together with them. And Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Where are they? We're supposed to be with the past saints together. 
Jesus also said that he would raise up all believers at the last day. John 6, 39 and 40. This is the will of the Father who sent me that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And he repeats it, that all the saved will be raised up at the last day. According to Michael's theology, the last day took place in 70, yet Jesus, 70 AD, yet Jesus spoke here of all New Testament believers for all time. So does that mean that we were previously raised from the dead in 70 AD? Yikes would be a good word here. And, and, and the specifics of the return of Jesus, Revelation 1-7, look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. All families of the earth will mourn over him. This is certain, amen. Hasn't happened yet. Matthew 24, 27, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man, visible to all. Hasn't happened yet. And, and the New Testament writers use vocabulary that spoke of a literal return, an arrival to a place, and a literal revealing and a little, literal shining forth. These cannot just be spiritualized away. Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, speak of Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, attack on Jerusalem, the Jewish people turning to God in repentance, God fighting for them and delivering them. That hasn't happened yet. It's never happened yet through history. Isaiah described the messianic future in these terms. Isaiah 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised up above the hills. All nations will stream to it, and many peoples will come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And what's going to happen? He'll settle disputes among the nations, provide arbitration for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They'll never again train for war. That has not happened. Again, to even say it hasn't happened is so self-evident, it's almost embarrassing to have to say it. Same thing in Isaiah 11, he describes the Messianic error. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. And he concludes by saying, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And remember, it was Peter in Acts 3, 21, who said this, heaven must receive him, Jesus, until the time of the restoration of all the things that God spoke about long ago through the mouth of his holy prophets. He said the words of the prophets, these literal words, Israel would be scattered, Israel would be preserved in judgment, Israel would be regathered, Israel would be saved. That the things that were promised would literally happen. Just as Jesus literally came, literally died for our sins, rose from the dead, born of a virgin, all the prophecies literally fulfilled, he will literally come again, as we saw reiterated in Acts 1, 10 and 11. If, if all prophecies are fulfilled in the book of Revelation is speaking of things already current and all of it is fulfilled, then the great white throne judgment has already taken place. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. I saw a great white throne and one seated on it, then heaven and earth fled from his presence, but no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened, another book was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according to what is written in the books. Death and Shoal were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So the final judgment, the great white, that's already happened. And not only so, hey, don't worry about vacations, going anywhere special. Don't worry about the world to come. You're already in the new heavens and new earth. It doesn't get any better than this. Here's how it's described in Revelation. Michael tells us it's now, it's present. I saw a new heaven and new earth, Revelation 21. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. I also heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and he shall tabernacle among them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them and be their God. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death, death shall be no more. Looks like death didn't get that memo either that it already happened. Nor shall there be mourning or crying or pain any longer for the former things have passed away. You must butcher the Bible. You must take texts and rip them away from their plain and simple meaning to say that we are currently living in the new heavens and the new earth. It's that simple. It's that clear. In fact, it's a dangerous spiritual game to go that way because you'll end up denying all kinds of other incredibly important things. That's why Paul addressed an issue in 2 Timothy 2, 16 to 18. 
avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying, this is what we heard tonight, that the resurrection has already happened. And saying what Paul dealt with in 1 Corinthians, that it was only a spiritual resurrection. They are upsetting the faith of some. There's a reason, friends, that church leaders through history have looked forward to the literal resurrection for the dead, not backward. And there's a reason they've spoken with virtually one mouth, despite many different end times uh, scenarios of ultimately recognizing that there will be a literal return of Jesus. And even though I base everything on scripture, when I see that the church through history has never entertained certain things, perhaps until the 1970s, certain things being taught the way they're being taught now, that alone makes me say, okay, big problem. When I see the Bible categorically against it and I see it never taught in church history, I don't even entertain a possibility of it. The Apostles' Creed, what does it say about Jesus? He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come. They didn't get the memo that he already came in 70 AD. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the resurrection of the body still to come. They didn't get the memo that it already happened spiritually. Or the Nicene Creed. He shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. They didn't get the memo that we were already in the world to come. And then the didache, the so-called teaching of the 12 apostles, perhaps from the end of the first century. So maybe within 30 years of the destruction of Jerusalem. What, is, what does it say? It speaks of the last days when false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied. And, it's, and it says this, that there will be a future resurrection. So chapter 16, verse 6, then shall appear the signs of the truth. First, first the signs spread out in heaven then the sign of the sound of the trumpet, and thirdly, the resurrection of the dead, but not of all the dead, but as it was said, the Lord shall come and all the saints with him. Then shall the world see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. Of course, they were looking forward to his return. So friends, these concepts were repeated century after century, since the scriptures clearly taught these truths, while reality taught us that Jesus had not yet returned and the dead had not yet been raised. There's a reason no one ever heard of the full position presented by Michael tonight before 1970. That's because it's utterly unscriptural, entirely indefensible. My opening presentation, along with my rebuttal, make this perfectly clear. And remember, while there are many mysteries in God's word, and while we'll spend eternity plumbing the depths of divine revelation, the Lord has spoken clearly to us that even a child can understand. And that means that as long as people are still dying, and sin is still raging, we know that Jesus has not returned, that we have not yet received our immortal bodies. And since he's not yet returned, we continue to prophesy, speak in tongues, operate with spiritual gifts, and by all means, continue with the Great Commission until everyone has heard. Thank you. Okay, before these uh, two rebuttals, take place where they will attempt to correct uh, mistakes in each other's presentations. The first mistake to be corrected will be my own. I have neglected to give the biographical information of our two guests when I introduced them, and to honor them uh, sufficiently, I think I should do that now. Uh, so we'll just take a moment. Michael J. Sullivan is a sovereign grace, full preterist author and apologist having graduated from Calvary Chapel Bible College and attended Master's College. He has co-authored the very popular full preterist book, House Divided, Bridging the Gap in Reformed Eschatology, A Preterist Response to When Shall These Things Be, hosted The Living Body Show on Fulfilled Radio and has been a speaker at various full preterist conferences. Mike has written over a hundred articles on fullpreterism.com and treeoflifeministries.info. Addressing such men as John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, James White, Kenneth Gentry, Gary DeMar, Shabir Ali, and Michael Brown. In areas pertaining to New Testament imminence and nature of fulfillment, as these pertain to Christian apologetics. He has also addressed MacArthur, Sproul, and Brown over the Strange Fire Conference lectures as to when and why the miraculous sign and revelatory gifts of tongues, prophecy, and knowledge ceased at Christ's coming in A.D. 70. 
Michael Brown is the founder and president of Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina, and he has served as a visiting or adjunct professor at seven leading seminaries. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University and has contributed scholarly articles to the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, the uh, New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, as well as Biblical and Semitic Journals. He is the author of more than 30 books, including Commentaries on Jeremiah and Job, and the highly acclaimed five-volume series Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. Dr. Brown hosts the daily syndicated talk radio show, The Line of Fire, along with several TV programs that air in the United States and abroad, and he is a national and international speaker on themes of spiritual revival and cultural reformation. He has debated Jewish rabbis, agnostic scholars, gay professors, and others on radio, TV, and college campuses, and is widely considered to be the world's foremost Messianic Jewish apologist. Now that you know more about our two debaters, we will turn the mics back over to them, and we'll have a 12-minute rebuttal, beginning with you, Michael. Testing. Well, thank you, Brother Brown, for a rigorous opening. I have so many passages here, obviously I can't get to all of them, uh, but I will make my way through them as best I can. Historical testimonies in the church, I guess we forgot to mention the Montanists, who were declared heretics. But, you know, once we get into church history arguments, it's, it's, it's kind of shaky ground. I mean, the church fathers are going to say that which is perfect is referring to the second coming. Yet it seems the overwhelming view of the early church fathers with it was that the gifts ceased. And both sides can kind of cite church history, but I think the church history argument favors my position. But that is not my emphasis, because I could care less. I'm not interested in church tradition. I'm interested in what scripture teaches. Um, he says, the fact that we're having this debate proves that he hasn't come. Really? Well, did you look at the chart I had? Because we don't, he said we don't need charts, but we need the analogy of Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. How were they seeing God's face in 1 Corinthians? Was it a physical scene? Then when we go to 2 Corinthians 3, we're letting Paul interpret Paul. There, he's looking into a mirror. They're looking into a mirror. Not only are they looking into a mirror and seeing God's face, but they are being transformed into the image of Christ. Were they like kind of half glowing as they walked? No, this is a spiritual scene of God and it's a spiritual transformation. Scripture is interpreting itself. Uh, and also the knowledge, this is a positional truth. All right, we can debate it. I am blessed in the heavenly realms with Christ, seated with him. I am in his presence. This is a spiritual truth. My righteousness, I'm not in his presence because of my righteousness. I'm in his presence because of the righteousness Christ has imputed on my account. That's the whole point in Revelation 22, verse 7, when it talks about the soon coming of Christ, which opens up the gates of the new Jerusalem, where the tree of life is accessible, which is Christ. And the, what is it? After Christ comes, the gates are open for the healing of the nations. I thought everything was perfect. If everything is perfect, why is there evangelism taking place after Christ comes and the nations are being healed coming to Mount Zion, coming to the New Jerusalem? What does Hebrews 12 tell us? Hebrews 12 tells us that we're Mount Zion. We're the New Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 4. We're the Jerusalem from above. Revelation 3.11 in the NIV captures the present tense properly. says that the new Jerusalem was in the process of coming down. Was it a big huge cube? Was it the board? Were they like, there it is, I think I see it, it's coming down. We're the new Jerusalem. This is figurative language. It's talking about the new covenant. You can mock it all at want, all you want, but this is scriptural. They mocked Christ, I'm sure. Jesus, didn't you get the memo? You're supposed to set up an earthly kingdom. You're saying your kingdom's not of the world? You're saying you're the 
the living bread, the spiritual water, all these miracles you do, you're always pointing to something spiritual. That's the point of the gifts. They were to point to the spiritual reality. They're not to continue. They point to something, the kingdom of God. And when it comes, this is when they cease. Uh, he talks about the order of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. In Michael's debate with uh, Sam Waldron, he's a Reformed Baptist, you can look it up on YouTube. Michael, I believe you conceded that the unique office of apostle as far as the 12, the foundation of the church with Christ being the chief cornerstone, you said that miraculous gift to the church is no longer present. So we go to Ephesians 4 and we go to 1 Corinthians 12 where the list has started off with apostles first, prophets, and there we go. So isn't Michael a little bit guilty of picking and choosing now? That office, that miraculous gift is gone. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I never said that partial predators like Sam Storms, um, N.T. Wright, D.A. Carson, so uh, C. Peter Wagner were full predators. I just said that their paradigm plus Michael's paradigm forms my paradigm. And I believe I demonstrated that. I also demonstrated that in our book when I refuted seven, me and my co-authors, David Green and Ed Hassard, we refuted seven reformed theologians that tried to refute our view. Try and get a copy of our book, House Divided, Bridging the Gap in Reformed Eschatology. I appealed only to reform theology to form my position. And that's what I've done tonight with Mike and his co-authors. R.C. Sproul says, we all know who R.C. Sproul is, I hope. He says that the coming of Christ in Revelation 22 happened in AD 70 and that we are seeing God right now in the new creation. So what does that mean? There's no more death, but there's a definite article. It's no more the death. It's the death that came through Adam the very day he sinned. It's spiritual death, separation, alienation from God. Jesus said, if you believe in me, what? You will never die. Is he talking about physical death? No, in the kingdom, there is no more death. He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death, spiritual separation and alienation from God. The whole point of us being face to face means Christ has paid it all. He talks about Hebrews 9. Why didn't we go to Hebrews 10, 37? When he says, talking about the coming of uh, the second appearing of Christ in Hebrews 9, he says, he who is coming will come in a very little while and will not tarry. If God wanted to communicate that Christ was going to come in the first century, how else could he have done it? Soon, quickly. So he uses every Greek word possible to create imminence. And then he tells you it won't be delayed. Michael has it delayed because he has a hyper-literal hermeneutic that doesn't allow him to see it. And that's really the problem. Acts 1.11, the Greek there is similar. He's going to come in a similar way. He's not going to come in the exact same way. That Greek word is used twice in Scripture, and it never means the exact same way. The parallel is the glory cloud. Christ is exalted in their midst. He's engulfed in the glory cloud and they're looking up and they're told that he's going to come back in a similar way. He's going to come back in the glory cloud. Doesn't mean that he has to physically be seen. That's not the point of the passage. He talks about 1 Thessalonians 5 through 10. Well, I strongly disagree. He tells the Thessalonians who are being persecuted by Jewish apostates and he says, you're going to receive relief when I come. And I'm going to give them the same kind of trouble that they've been giving you. So what happened? All these groups went to Jerusalem, right? And the Romans surrounded, the, surrounded Jerusalem. They, they went out. Those Thessalonians fled the city. Their persecutors stayed for the feasts and were destroyed. And trouble and tribulation came upon them. So yes, they were delivered. They were given relief. They went to Pella, which was known to be a Greek city, military city. They were anti-Jews. 
They didn't want anything to do with these Jews revolting against Rome. So when the Christians fled there, they were welcome because they were peaceful. No, no, no. Our kingdom is not of this world. Uh, Romans 6, 16, 20, how was Satan oppressed? What does James say? Why are there wars and fights among you? It's because of the demons and, and Satan. No, it's because of your wicked hearts. We don't need Satan around to have wars and problems like that. Uh, he mentioned Daniel 12. Well, he surely forgot verse 7 that connects the abomination of desolation that Jesus says is going to take place in his generation with the resurrection. And he says, all these things, the abomination of desolation, the tribulation, and the resurrection will be fulfilled when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. That's just another way of saying Jerusalem is going to be judged. The holy people are the Jews, the old covenant Jews, not a future group of Jews. What's the power of the holy people? The power is the old covenant. When the scepter departs from Judah in Israel's last days, which is AD 70, that power is going to cease. It's going to be given to the church through the gospel. So Daniel 12 makes my case. And Paul quoting the resurrection of Daniel 12 in Acts 24, verse 15, says that there was about to be a resurrection of the just and unjust. Was Paul just giving you his opinion about that? Or was he inspired? Because if he was inspired, that doesn't support Dr. Brown's position. John 5, you've got, they divide it up into two different resurrections. There's a spiritual resurrection in the gospel, and then there's this physical. They're out of the grave. See, it's literal. But you just interpreted the voice and coming out and death and life is spiritual, but now all of a sudden it's physical. And just because it talks about graves, plural, have you read Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37? They came out of their graves when they came back into the land under Ezra and Nehemiah. It was a corporate covenantal resurrection. And that's the resurrection that's talked about in John 5 as well. Except this resurrection is a gathering into Christ. It's not a gathering back into a land. It's in a person. Under the old covenant, all the blessings were in the land. In the land. When we get to the new covenant and Jesus shows up, what's Paul's favorite phrase? He uses it 66 times. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. These are where all the promises are. Yes and amen. In Christ. It's got nothing to do with the physical land. He talks about physical Jerusalem. What does the author of Hebrews say? Hebrews 13, 14. Please look it up. Look it up in the Young's Little Translation. He says, here we do not have an abiding city. In Jerusalem, that's where he is. We do not have an abiding city, an eternal city. Dr. Brown talks about the Jerusalem over in Israel as the eternal city. I beg to differ. The new Jerusalem, we are the eternal city. We are Mount Zion, according to Scripture. Uh, okay. And just real quick, I have a real fiery personality. I was told by a friend to make sure you smile. And it's, it's not because I mean, it's just I get real intense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I hate to use rebuttal time to refute false statements about my own positions, but almost everything that was said about my position was either inaccurate or exaggerated or off. For example, my alleged views of the 70 weeks of Daniel misrepresented, or that Dr. Peter Wagner was an authority for my beliefs misrepresented, or that you could take those scholars plus mine and come up with Michael's position bogus, completely bogus. And, and just to give you an idea of how the scripture just get like ripped apart in, in, a, in a way that's actually painful to hear, we were told, you don't need the devil, James 4, right? Where the struggles come from, they come from your own flesh. We'll keep reading a few more verses in James. What does it say? Resist the devil. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. James apparently didn't get the memo. And, and things like 1 Corinthians 13, 
Seeing face to face is what Paul referred to in 2 Corinthians 3, seeing face to face. Hang on, hang on. Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed yet. We don't see face to face yet. How in the world? Can, uh, it, it, it boggles the mind as I listen to some of these things. It's also interesting, you know, even though there's been that sense of imminence for every generation, and, and it's, it's part of the prophetic language, soon, at the door. I, I give you examples from the Old Testament where something is soon at the door and it doesn't happen for 500 years, where a prophecy is going to happen now and the first part happens now and the rest of it happens centuries later or even 2,500 years later. I give you numerous examples of that if needed, if asked for. So it's in keeping with prophetic language. But isn't it interesting that every generation is, has lived with that sense of the judge being at the door and lived with that sense of imminence? And not only so, Jesus in the Gospels talks about, he gives parables that his, his return is like a king going on a long journey or a master going on a long journey, and he doesn't come back for a while, and people think he's delaying his coming. And, and they get lazy and fall to sin. Why, if it was going to happen so quickly? And, and not, not only so, Peter raises the issue in 2 Peter 3 that in the last days, which we're still in the last days, biblically are from the, the cross until the end of the age, that, that Peter specifically says that they're going to be scoffers saying, where's the promise? Where is it? Why? Because it hasn't happened. It looked like it should have happened a while ago, and it hasn't happened. What's the answer? Don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord does not delay his promises. Some understand delay, but it's patient with you. So some will think it's delay, but it's not. Because God has a different calendar. And that's why every generation you live with that sense of imminence. And along the way, God breaks in. God breaks in in many, many different ways. Uh, not only so, there are Greek scholars. And I've done my best not to quote other scholars. I've done my best just to quote scripture. Because it's interesting. We're told scripture is all that matters. And we keep hearing this scholar says this, this here scholar says that. Without, again, telling you that not a single one of those scholars agrees with his position. Every single one of them rejects the position that he's putting forth. And notice that church history has to be completely thrown out as if it's meaningless that no major leaders or groups throughout church history taught or preached what's being preached in full here tonight, ever, until about 50 years ago. That's why you have to throw out church history. That's why you have to say it doesn't matter. That's a scary position. Very scary position. To find no support whatsoever. And Acts 111, to say it's only similar, well, there was, there, there was not a glory cloud with the Son of Man in it in, in, in the destruction of the temple in 70, okay? You have to say it's just language or it's figurative speech, but it did not literally happen. Similar way, same way, it didn't literally happen. And by the way, it's a shame that most old translations didn't know it's same. They got it all wrong. Also very interesting as well. Uh, let me go back to some of the other things that were, were said. Oh, uh, Isaiah prophesied that the church would be placed Israel. Of course he did. Of course he spoke of God's ongoing faithfulness to Israel. In fact, in Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37, other voices of the prophets said, no matter what this physical people does, even if they're disciplined, God will still preserve them because he's made eternal promises. If God could break his promises to literal Israel, he could break his promises to the church. We were told, quote, the New Testament hermeneutic was spiritual. Well, what about Jesus prophesied to be born of a virgin? He was born in Bethlehem. He was literally die a criminal's death. He did literally rise from the dead. He did literally ascend to heaven to the right hand of the Father. He did all that. That sounds pretty literal to me. Shall we keep going? There's going to be evangelism in the New Jerusalem. Uh huh. The end of Revelation 22 gives a message to everyone listening then, whoever hears come. It doesn't say there's going to be evangelism in the New Jerusalem. That's not what the text says. And as the nations come into the eternal kingdom, there's healing restoration. It doesn't say they're going to be getting sick. In fact, we're told there's going to be no more sickness or pain. You can have all the charts you want, but the, the verses plainly say that sorrow will cease. End of, end of pain, end of death. That has not yet happened. To say it happened, you can easily go from here into all kinds of bizarre spiritual positions, which is why... It's interesting, in the book House Divided, one of the co-authors has contacted me in recent years. He's completely repudiated the position. He says it's dangerous. Stay away from it. He a, wrote a whole book repudiating it. I just had another guy on my show the other day, held to the same position, has completely repudiated it. It's very dangerous. There's a reason. And that's why I'm so passionate, because I want to warn people about the seriousness of this danger. We were told that N.T. Wright, yes, a great New Testament scholar, but I differ with many of his points, said that heaven and earth passing away equals the old covenant temple. When 
in the scripture does the term heaven and earth refer to the, the temple in Israel? It doesn't. Or to Jerusalem? It doesn't. You know what it means? Heaven and earth. Wow. That was a big insight. You had to come just to hear that. You know, Matthew 16, 27 and 28, which speaks of the some of the disciples living to see the Son of Man come in glory, the power of his kingdom. Well, all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, amazingly, all three Gospels follow that with a transfiguration account where Jesus is transfigured and where they see him in his glory. And then John in Revelation sees him in his glory. Isn't that remarkable? And, and I'm very happy in cross-examination to get into Matthew 24, 34, if desired. But there are several different ways to read that. You see, the disciples asked a threefold question. They didn't understand all these things, and they said, what will be, when are these things going to happen? When is Jerusalem destroyed? And what's the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So Jesus answers all three of those questions in one passage. And in fact, when you read it in Luke 21, it breaks down a little more easily. This is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in our day. This is referring to the final coming and final destruction. And this is very common in the prophets that they will speak of things one through ten that will happen, and the first four or five happen immediately, and the next five happen later. We see it even with prophecies about Jesus coming, right? That at the end of Isaiah 52 says he'll be highly exalted, but he's going to first suffer. There's a gap in between of a long period of time before the whole world recognizes him. Again, clearly laid out in Scripture. Uh, and again, the, the word soon, Greek scholars will also indicate it can speak of manner, swiftly, suddenly, and they're being right at the door. And as again in Scripture, we have many times where God comes in power, God visits. There are days of the Lord, but there is the final day of the Lord. Notice we didn't hear about John 6, that, that the last day allegedly happened when Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70, but that's when we all get raised from the dead. And I, I was just told that I'm mixing the words of Jesus, twisting what he said. What does it say in John 5? That there are those he's speaking to that will hear his voice and they will receive life. And then those who are in the graves, he's making the distinction there. I didn't make that up. He's making the distinction. And, if, and, and here's the big question. Since the Bible speaks of us getting new bodies, literal, new, eternal bodies, as surely as we have a natural body, we will get a glorious body. Our lowly bodies will be transformed, like his resurrected body. And then it speaks of him coming in flaming fire. It speaks of his arrival. It speaks of him coming in a way that everyone can see. How else could the biblical authors have possibly explained this to make it more literal, more clear? What else could they have said more than what was said? See, if you are dead set on spiritualizing everything, you can make any words change, and where this will ultimately lead is of great concern to me. Let's see if we have time for a couple of other things here. The idea that we are the new Jerusalem, again, is taking a homiletical statement Paul makes in Galatians 4, speaking of a heavenly scene in Hebrews 12, and now going beyond what Scripture says. Scripture does not say that we are the new Jerusalem. No, we inhabit the new Jerusalem. And even the argument that was made about apostles, my position was misrepresented. And, and you've got to realize there's a consistency here. Scriptures are misrepresented. The position of the person up here is misrepresented. And, and that causes me concern. It's one thing if we differ on interpretation of the Bible. It's another one when you yourself are misrepresented and false positions have to be put in your mouth to buttress someone else's argument. That is also an indicator of something terribly wrong. So to be clear, what I said was, of course, apostles still exist today. Prophets still exist today. The New Testament is clear on that. But the 12 apostles were unique. Who argues with that? That's what I, said. I never said. Pick and choose and, and cut that up into different pieces. It's also interesting that if the book of Revelation is speaking of all events that had to happen immediately and were past, isn't that interesting that it speaks of a thousand-year reign? Well, how, how that happen? if that happened immediately, how do you get a thousand years in before the year 70? If, if, Revelation, if you go with the early date of Revelation, say it was, it was written in 68 or 69, how do you get a thousand years between 68 and 70? My math may not be as good as it was years ago, but I think it doesn't work if I'm correct here. And, and what do we do with the picture that Peter lays out? That this current heaven and earth will burn up with fire. And it'll be renovated and changed. And the new ones, there will be righteousness. 
So, in, in sum, it's unfortunate that we have to debate these things because the church has never debated them in history. Never debated whether there will be a future resurrection of the dead. I am 100% all for deeply spiritual interpretations and being in Jesus and being in the Spirit and all that's there. But I also know that God's a God that literally keeps his promise in a literal world. And if you can't be trusted there, if saying there'll be no more sorrow, pain, and death means that everyone's going to still have sorrow, pain, and death, except you just think you won't. If, if it says there's going to be a literal physical resurrection, but that just gets changed into a spiritual one. If the Bible is 100% clear that Jesus will literally return and set up his kingdom, and that now doesn't mean that which is spoken, it's that becomes whatever we want it to be. If, if you're going to go this direction, you might as well not use the Bible. Just create what you want to believe and come up with your own beliefs, but don't misrepresent Scripture and twist the plain meaning of the Word of God to fit a system that simply isn't there. Never was, never will be. Thank you. Did I smile? I must, I'm just smile. Because I'm passionate too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have a cross-examination, and we're going to uh, give each participant a minimum of seven minutes to do the cross-exam. Uh, Michael will go first, and he can take anywhere from seven to ten minutes to cross-examine, and whatever amount of time he takes, Michael Brown will be given the same amount of time uh, to cross-examine uh, Michael Sullivan. Uh, we're going to ask so we get enough questions in that each of you will uh, keep your questions uh, no longer than 30 seconds in length and keep your responses to no longer than two minutes. We won't time those, but I think we'll all start to feel fidgety and I'll, I'll let you know if either of you is going too long. <laughs> all righty, Michael. Am I on? Testing, testing. All right. Um, Dr. Brown, uh, let's talk about apocalyptic language because in your, in your book you do, in a footnote, uh, do discuss Matthew 24 and recognize that Christian Orthodox scholars have referred to the coming of Christ on the clouds as AD 70, and they go back to the Old Testament, such as Isaiah 13, Isaiah 19, Isaiah 34, you know, passages, where God is said to come swiftly on a cloud and the day of the Lord was near. Is that literal language or apocalyptic? Yeah, so uh, it's some is apocalyptic and some contains literal First, my whole case could rise and fall without any reference to Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 could refer to Jesus coming in judgment in Jerusalem at that time in apocalyptic language. That wouldn't affect my case whatsoever. The, the rest of Scripture is so abundantly clear. But having said that, there are times, for example, Isaiah 24 through 27, that apocalyptic language is speaking of the end of the age. There are other times, like Isaiah 13, where it's speaking of judgment on a particular nation that was coming quickly. So sometimes the quickly was... It, I mean, it literally, sometimes it was quickly meaning God's going to move swiftly and suddenly. So it has to be interpreted in context. And everything that's there in Matthew 24, when we look at all the language and sending forth his angels to gather the elect and the various other things, and then everyone seeing it, I have to say, no, that, that did not happen. That cannot simply be dissolved into apocalyptic language. Thank you very much. In Ezekiel chapter 7 and 12, um, we're told that the day of the Lord is near. And that it would not, or it, and it would be without delay. This is Ezekiel 12, 23 to 25, and Ezekiel 7, 7. But it was the false prophets who sought to change the meaning of God's revelation from near and without delay to the vision of Ezekiel sees it for many years in a distant future. Mm -hmm. Do you see the seriousness? And I'm not saying you're a false prophet. I'm just saying, do you see the seriousness of changing the meaning of near to something actually far off. That's not the meaning in the Old Testament. It's not the meaning in the New Testament. Well, again, it, it, it does depend on context. For example, here in, in Ezekiel, we know that he prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem and he was mute until the Jerusalem fell and the 33rd chapter he can speak again. So there were things that he described that were imminent, but he also described, for example, in, in seeing he was going to be participating in Ezekiel 40 through 48. And it's in God's system, and you'll do this, and you'll do that. You would have thought that that was the temple that the Jewish people were going to build when they returned from exile, but they didn't. So there within Ezekiel is something that, as far as you can tell, it's going to happen in his lifetime. And yet, in fact, it's either never happened, or in your theology, it, it happened five or six hundred years later. That's good. Let, 
let me veer from this and discuss that. In your writings, you talk about the Messianic temple. Haggai talks about a glorious temple, a temple of peace. It's gonna, the glory of that temple is going to exceed anything that Solomon built. And they were disappointed. They wept when they saw what was built in Ezra and Nehemiah's time. You correctly connect the Ezekiel temple of chapter 37 with the church. And when Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.16 says that we are the temple, and you look in your cross-reference, it's Ezekiel 37.27. And you correctly quote, you know, when Jesus says, according to the scriptures, out of your heart will flow living water, you say that's the temple of Ezekiel 47. I'm struggling because you're, to me, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. You're saying that this is fulfilled spiritually and it's the church, but it's also referring to a physical temple someday in a thousand years. Um, the, the Apostle Paul doesn't give it two meanings. He gives it one. Yeah, so you're, you're confusing a few different things in my position as well as a number of different scriptures. Haggai 2 was fulfilled. God filled the tabernacle with his glory, his literal presence. He filled the first temple with his glory. And with Jesus coming and sending the Spirit, he filled the second temple with his glory. I, I, I use the exact language, the, the, the Hebrew, uh, to, to fill with glory, right? So uh, uh, lay that out clearly, show every time it's used what it refers to, and it's referring to that glorious spiritual presence. So I say that Haggai 2 was fulfilled with that physical second temple. That's one thing. We also know that God said in, in Leviticus, in Ezekiel, I will dwell in you, I will dwell among you. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 6 does quote those things and applies them. Yes, why can't there be a spiritual temple of all people? We are the spiritual temple, 1 Peter 2. We are, we are stones in the new temple. Why can't there be that and a literal physical promise as well? All right. For example, well, God said he would literally scatter his Jewish people. He preserved them in judgment and bring them back. He's done that literally. Well, at the same time, we are a spiritual temple. Why can't it be both? Uh, okay, the book of Hebrews, let me explain that. And I know you're not supposed to be asking me questions, but in Hebrews, let me turn that around. In Hebrews, we go from physical types and shadows of the old covenant system to mm -hmm. the spiritual or better things under the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Can you share with me um, where the author of Hebrews goes from physical type to spiritual anti-type back to a physical... Now, you teach that the Levites in Ezekiel are the church, we're the priests in the, new, in the new kingdom, in the temple, it's a spiritual temple. But you also say the priesthood is going to be um, reinstitutionalized. Um, and you say that Ezekiel being a, a priest is describing language of the new covenant in ways that only he could in a temple, because that's his worldview, that's how blessings are. And you apply them spiritually, but the author of Hebrews doesn't go back to your literal hermeneutic. He stays within physical to spiritual. Yeah, so first thing, I didn't say that the priest that Ezekiel prophesied referred to the church. I've never said that or, or written about this. Uh, uh, your commentary on Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23 and Jeremiah 33. Not Jeremiah 23, you're referring to Jeremiah 33. And when I say right. it's Jewish believers that, that are of that physical descent can also carry that out. I, I never said that, that Ezekiel prophesied of Levites and that means the church. I'll However, right, right, so just, just to be clear on that. And just... I, I hate to be harsh about it, but if you're going to represent my position, just represent it more accurately so I don't have to rebut. I'll do a follow-up article and I'll quote that and I'll let you feel, feel, well, feel free. Okay, so Hebrews is addressing a particular thing. Does Hebrews ever say the church has become Israel? No. Does Hebrews ever say that Jesus will not, the Messiah will not literally come? No. He, he doesn't deny any of that. He's just making a spiritual emphasis that the temple's about to be destroyed and we have a new and better way. If I can interject real quick. Um, he says that what Abraham and the, the forefathers looked for was a spiritual city. In Hebrews 13, 14, he says that city was about to come. He doesn't say, oh, it's a spiritual city, but we're going to get another physical one. He says we don't have an abiding city here. He's contrasting Old Covenant Jerusalem with New Covenant Jerusalem. And yes, the New Jerusalem is the church. It is the New Covenant relationship. Right. So, so again, uh, you are butchering the Bible. There are scores and scores and scores and scores and scores and scores of verses in the Old Testament 
several hundred actually, that make clear that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants were looking for a physical inheritance and a physical land. Hebrews was not throwing that out. Hebrews is not denying that. Well, where is he affirming it? He's making, he doesn't have to affirm it because you don't, you can't tear up the Bible. You see, that's well, don't the, you think that's, that would be important? Can, 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 can I reply? If what comes after can tear up everything that went before, then it's false. The Jewish people were told, reject it. If it comes and tears up that which is before, reject it. That's why Jesus says, don't think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill not abolish. And right. it promises, according to, according to Paul, Romans 15, that the Messiah confirms the promises to the patriarchs. And All Paul right. says in Galatians Let's 3 that a promise can, can, that the promise given to the patriarchs cannot be undone by the law. All right, let's pick that up in Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Your uh, colleague, Sam Storm, says that this heaven and earth passed away in 870. You say that heaven and earth can never refer to the old covenant. Are you familiar with uh, the new treasure of scripture knowledge. Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, in Isaiah 51, verses 15 and 16, when it's talking about Israel coming out of Egypt and the Red Sea, he says that he planted the heavens and the earth at that point. Uh, the treasure of scripture knowledge affirms that that is referring to Old Covenant Israel. And Sam Storms sees that. G.K. Beale sees that. Yeah, they, they, uh, all have a certain, of, right, they all have a certain theology which denies literal promises to literal Israel. That's a misinterpretation of Isaiah 51. But it, uh, I can break it down, if, if you like. But uh, it does not say that heaven and earth refer to the old covenant or to the temple. All right? That, the, that, that these things that God puts in the mouth of his servant, this is to confirm what he's spoken. The, and, and better translation, I have put my words in your mouth, covered you with the shadow of my hand. I who set the heavens in place and laid the foundations of the earth and who say to Zion, you are my people. Okay. Hi. Uh, uh, okay. Dr. Brown, your turn. All right. You have 10 minutes. All right, great. Um, so I'll be as concise as I can. Okay. Um, hang on, wrong page. Actually, my page of questions, do I have it here? Oh, here we go. Okay. So what words could the biblical authors have used that would be spoken of a literal physical return of Jesus and a literal physical resurrection of the dead beyond the language that they used, which is quite explicit, quite detailed, and, and, and technical, and physical, and literal? What language could they have used to convey this in a way that you would not try to spiritualize away? Hmm. Well, it's interesting, again, going back to N.T. Wright uh, that you mentioned in your um, Authentic Fire book. He points out that a Jew in the first century would have never conceived of a literal cloud coming physical person on a cloud. They would always associate that with figurative language because that's the language of the prophets. That's what they knew. As far as resurrection, no, they were very much uh, Tom Holland, uh, N.T. Wright, other scholars are are starting to develop the corporate body view. Um, you know, when Israel would be captive and taken into a foreign nation, Assyria or Babylon, it, they died corporately. And when they came back in the land, it was a resurrection. So they had this understanding of a corporate resurrection, and they had the language of, you know, bone, skin coming on the bones. So, so what language I, could I, have been this, used then? If Paul could say he's going to transform our lowly body. And, and by the way, I differ with N.T. Wright about coming in the clouds. No, and there, there are many, many other ways that his coming is described as literal and physical, and everyone will see it, etc. But since you're denying the literality of a future resurrection, and Paul says he's going to transform our lowly body, this physical body will put on immortality. What other words could he, the dead will come out of the graves? Will decay no longer. What other words can be used to describe it? Okay. So Philippians 3, let's start there. The context of Philippians 3, he's talking about his life in the old covenant world. And he says, what does he say about that? He talks about circumcision and he talks about spiritual circumcision. He talks about his life in the old covenant system. What does he say? He says he considers it as dung. I think we all know what that means. So now you take dung, and he's talking about the vile body. Now you take that as the physical body. I don't see our physical bodies as being evil or vile. That would be Gnostic. I do not take that position. So in context, when he's talking about 
having attained the resurrection to a degree, well, why would he even have to say that if it was a physical resurrection? So obviously there's something else going on there. So it's a spiritual resurrection that he is attaining. The vile, lowly body is the old covenant body that's going to be transformed into... Oh, okay, so I haven't gotten even the slightest answer to my question yet. Not even a hint of an answer. What language could have been used that would describe physical, literal resurrection that would convince you that's what it's talking about? Because every explicit text speaking in a physical, literal term and describing it in, in every way we could describe it, you're spiritualizing away. I mean, the reasons to me, I, I, I dismiss utterly on an exegetical level. But please tell me what language could have been used that would express physical resurrection in such a way that you would believe what everyone's believed through church history, that there'll be a future physical resurrection. Right. So obviously our paradigms are so opposite that I'm saying, well, the imminence is so clear. How could he have said it any other way? And so you're approaching it on the nature of the resurrection. But yet I can go to the Old Testament and I can understand what near means. I can understand what apocalypse means. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it, I'm getting it. And I can understand from the Old Testament what resurrection is, a corporate body. What language could be used, sir, where God could convey in the Bible that he means a literal resurrection that you would not spiritualize away? It seems whatever language you use, you're going to find a way to spiritualize it because it doesn't fit your paradigm. So I'll ask you one last time. If there's no possible language, just say so, that God could not have possibly put it in writing in any way that you would accept it meant to physical, literal resurrection. Well, I look at those passages in context, and the passages well, in what context. Would say, what language? Tell me. What language? What would tell you? Well, if I'm in John five and I hear the voice of the Son of God, and that's a spiritual resurrection. What language would? I'm asking the same question. I haven't gotten an answer. I'm giving you an answer. I'm You're saying the, no language. No language would convey. I didn't say no language. I said I'm accepting the language, and I'm accepting mm -hmm. it in context. And oh, okay. Here. So I've got no answer to my question, no matter how many times okay, I ask I it, which is unfortunate. Okay. Very unfortunate. In, in Revelation 21, it says, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Neither there will be mourning, crying, or pain anymore for the form of things that passed away. Of course, they haven't passed away. They're still here. You're saying that there's no more mourning, crying, pain, that these have all passed away. No more tears, no more death. So please explain that there's no more mourning, crying, or pain anymore in this new Jerusalem even though you say we're in it now. Sure. Uh, under the Old Covenant, there was mourning. Whenever Israel was separated from Jerusalem and the temple, you can read the prophets. They wept. They mourned. That was where God's presence was. They were alienated from him. They were, they were in death, Scripture says in Hosea, that God struck them and they died when they were in exile. So there was pain. There was suffering. There were tears because the Old Covenant could not forgive their sins. They constantly had to offer up sacrifices. So that pain and those tears are related to the inability of the Old Covenant to produce what it needed and to give them the relationship with God that they need. Now, hang on. In Revelation 21, when he's talking about the fulfillment of Isaiah 65 and 66, sir, there is physical death. In the new creation, there is tears, there is birth, there is labor, there is sinners, and there's evangelism taking place in the new creation of Isaiah 65. And you say those words with, you, you genuinely mean what you just said. Well, according to your hyper-literal hermeneutic of Isaiah. Nothing hyper-literal. All I'm doing is, is there's nothing hyper-literal, okay? It, it, unless it's hyper-literal to call you Michael and say that you're sitting here and that you have a bottle of water next to you. Unless that's hyper-literal. All I'm doing is just... What the words say? No more. It doesn't say mourning because of old covenant or crying. Or, I mean, it's well, that's the same prophecy of Isaiah sixty-five and sixty-six, right? Excuse me. It's the same prophecy. Revelation twenty-one and twenty-two is the fulfillment of Isaiah sixty-five and sixty-six. No, it's, it's yeah, it's the ultimate it's, fulfillment of everything right. spoken. So you're kind of right. given an incomplete representation of what no, is in Isaiah. I'm just reading what's written here. But again, your answers speak volumes. He who believes in me will never die. That's that's the point of the. Being in There'll the be no mourning, crying, or pain anymore. So there's mourning, crying, pain, so we're not in the new Jerusalem. John 6, 
Jesus said he would raise up all believers at the last day. So these are believers saved through all the ages. Uh, so these are people that have been saved right up until today. And uh, you say the last day was in 70. So how did Jesus raise up everybody that hadn't even been saved yet, raise us up already in the year 70? Well, the last day, of course, is the last day of the last, of the last days. Uh, in Hebrews, Jesus appears at the end of the last days of an age. Did Jesus appear at the last days of the Old Covenant? Well, that makes sense. That was only 70, 40 years from his incarnation or his earthly ministry. Or did he appear at the last days of the Christian age, which has now exceeded the age of the Old Covenant? So when I see the last day, I'm going to interpret it in its proper context of the last days, which is Israel's last days. Um, as far as the resurrection there, yeah, Hades was emptied. The dead were raised out of Hades into God's presence. And I don't take that physically. I don't believe that, the, that you know, people on the grave... It says all who, all that the Father will give, this is speaking of all believers to all ages, will be raised at the last day. So that's obviously a future event. You're saying it happened in 70. So how did someone who got saved today or saved five years ago, how did they get raised in, in the year 70. Well, I'm looking at this big cross over here, and I'm wondering how did a historical event such as the cross redeem people from Genesis to the end of world history in your view? You would accept that Messiah doing a historical event in time and history can do something for all people, correct? Well, that's how I see the parousia. There are two historical events within Israel's last days that accomplish salvation for all all of his people. Uh, didn't answer my question still. Simple question. It says, I will raise him up at the last day. Right? So he gives us a specific time. You are telling us that that specific time is the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Yes. That's when he will raise us up. So believers before that were not raised up according to you. They were not seated in heavenly places and raised. They were raised out of Hades. I answered that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so they were already raised, but, but you're saying it's so, what happens to the future? Okay, we're done. We've got a five-minute closing argument uh, by each of the presenters, and then we will open it up for you to ask a few questions for just a few minutes. Michael, would you? Is it a closing argument or a uh, okay. conclusion? Oh, oh, just okay. a closing statement. Gotcha. All right. Well, the reason I'm here is because I struggled with this issue, and this is just heart to heart. We've kind of done the debating, and I, I might address some of that, but I was under Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, and I was going to church there, and I was going to John Wimber's church, the vineyard in Anaheim. And I was trying to figure out, as a young Christian, I was about 18 or 19 at that time, and I was really zealous. I was trying to figure out why healings weren't taking place. I was trying to figure out why when people spoke in tongues, it was just gibberish. It was never known human languages like we see in the book of Acts. That dawned on me. It, it kind of back my head. And, and then the prophecies were always so vague. There's someone here with a backache and it's like 3,000 people. Or the words of knowledge were so vague like, you know, someone here has, you know, cancer. Well, yeah, you're going to probably hit someone there. God never was able, apparently, to tell the prophets, the name of the person or, or a condition. And it was just, I struggled with it. Why was it that the Holy Spirit, when power came and fire came, he just had the ability to make people shake or laugh. He had the power to do that for everybody, but the poor guy in the wheelchair never got healed. They could lengthen someone's leg half an inch, good chiropractor could do that, but the amputees just sat there. Michael Brown tells us, and I've heard other charismatics say this, the reason we're not experiencing revival today here is because of our naturalistic culture, our materialistic culture. We're not desperate enough. So what you do is you go home like I did and you cry and say, Lord, why don't you talk to me the way you talk to these people? You're always talking to them. You're always giving them a dream. I want that. Eventually, I convinced myself that I spoke in tongues. But I knew something was wrong. And so when I went to Pastor John MacArthur's church, I wanted to be convinced. I'll be honest with you. 
but I was an educated charismatic. I gave all the arguments that Dr. Brown gives in his authentic fire. And if you go to my website, I've responded to every argument that Dr. Brown has used. The Great Commission argument, the Last Days argument, that was just perfect. Um, so I gave those arguments to my pastor, Pastor MacArthur, because all he was doing was talking about the abuses of it. And I never got any answers until the Predators of You came along. And I remember it like yesterday. I was in my dorm room. And I was saying, you know, dispensationalism, I've got to just rethink this. I've got to at least be open to other views in the church. So I did a report on the kingdom of God. And I started looking at partial preterists, and I started looking at all millennialists. And Mike is wrong when he says, oh, yeah, I could take a, the coming of Christ in Matthew 24 as 80, 70. That wouldn't ruin my view. Yes, it would. Because even D.A. Carson says, whatever your view is in Matthew 24 will dictate the rest of your eschatology in the New Testament. It is the cornerstone of eschatology. And I showed all the parallels between all of the discourse and Paul's eschatology. Paul's just following and flowing from the Olivet discourse. Mike appealed to church tradition. Hey, what, where was forensic justification for 1,500 years? Ever think about that? What did John Eck tell Luther? Luther, you're wrong. You can't be right. I reject this completely because there's no one in church history for the last 1,500 years. That's what I hear my brother telling me. Uh, what happened to Sola Scriptura? I think I'll go, go with that. Um, sum up my lecture. You know, uh, How else could have Christ and the apostles said that he was going to come in their generation in some of their lifetimes. It's, Even you standing here will witness. I mean, how else could he have done it? So Michael appeals in the other direction on the on the language of resurrection. Well, if you under if you look in the old covenant, you'll see a corporate resurrection. You'll see a spiritual resurrection. It's there. That's the Jews had that view. Look into works like N.T. Wright. Look into reformed works like G.K. Beale, Tom Holland, and you'll begin to see it. It's there. I do not have the time to go through all of that. He threw out a million passages, and I did my best to cover what I could. I love Dr. Brown. He's a, the epitome on one scale. He's an Arminian. He's a Zionist, and he's a charismatic. I'm a five-point superlapsarian Calvinist. I'm a preterist, definitely not a Zionist. Hope we can debate that sometime. And uh, I'm definitely a cessationist. So we are separate. But what does our passage tell us? To love each other. It is love that causes me to be as forceful as I've been tonight. And to be honest, I, I didn't I really didn't want to insert the point. I really didn't want to have this debate because it's a very sad thing to even debate, is there going to be a resurrection from the dead? Will Jesus really return? Was everyone in church history wrong? It's, it's one thing to say things were missed for hundreds of years, but everybody got it wrong until 50 years ago. It's a sad thing. And to have someone up passionately arguing for something that Paul warned about, to say the resurrection is past, that's painful. And it's, it's a reason I, I didn't want to do this debate, not for fear of what would come up to me. As I said from the start, there's no debate to be had, to be honest. However, it's grievous to even put these issues on the table as if we can wonder about whether Jesus will really return and keep his promises. And one of the saddest things was the tacit admission that there's no possible language God could have used that my friend did not have spiritualized the way. He, he could not, with all of the opportunities I gave him, he could not give me any language where God could speak a physical, literal resurrection and he would accept it. That's scary. So no matter what God communicated, no matter how he said it, he was spiritualized the way. And of course, we see in the Gospels, again, Jesus likening his return to something that requires perseverance. Even asking in Luke 18, will people have faith when he returns? And, and, and even saying, persevere, 
Don't lose heart. Why? Because people would be tempted to lose heart and wonder what happened to the promise of his coming. And Paul is the one that urges us to pursue prophecy and not to forbid tongues. I'm going to go with Paul. And as much as my friend referred to Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, he kept quoting what other scholars said. I did my best to quote Scripture, 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 Scripture. Interestingly, as I came to faith in a Pentecostal church in 1971, by God's mercy, saved from a heavy drug lifestyle of a couple of years, spoke in tongues and saw God move, I had questions too. I had disappointment. Why don't we see more happening? And that brought me to a period of skepticism in the late 70s, early 80s, where I did my best to deny these things. I did my best to question charismatic TV preachers, whether this was real or not. But I couldn't get away from the plain sense of Scripture. And it's really dangerous to base your theology on your experience. As Michael has testified to doing in many ways, that bad experiences caused him to change his theology. I've heard from many readers of Authentic Fire, they said, you're right. I, I'm a cessationist because of bad experience, but you've convinced me scripturally. That's why I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the Hebrew word for healing in its ancient Greek context, because I had so many thousands of questions. What's remarkable, though, is God is moving with extraordinary power around the world. And, and, and you want to talk about miracles of every kind, dead, literally being raised and documented. I read one of the most incredible stories about a man raised from the dead in Africa. He was in the morgue. He was three days dead. He was in the morgue. He was partially embalmed. You got the whole village and city testifying to it. And then Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Miracles, with extraordinarily carefully documented cases and, and, and scientifically reviewed, peer-reviewed articles where people would pray for blind and deaf, and, and you had doctors there from Harvard University, I believe it was, doctors with their equipment examining people before prayer and after prayer, and testifying, I think it was over half the cases healed. One of our colleagues, one of the grads from our ministry school, in, in one meeting, one meeting where he was preaching in Nigeria, one meeting, three kids in the same family, all blind, were instantly healed. God's doing wonderful and amazing things. But if I never saw another person healed, I believe in healing because God specifically says so. It's in his nature to do these things. And if I never spoke in tongues, I believe it because God says these things will continue until what? The perfect, not destruction of Jerusalem, where life went on the same way and where I have to explain to you that you're not in mourning and you're not crying and there aren't tears because it only refers to a spiritual old covenant. No, no, no. And remember, the joy of the Lord is your strength and your presence falls of joy. Those are Old Testament truths. There was joy and forgiveness and grace there as well. Friends, this is a serious writing of the Bible. It is a position that is dangerously wrong. And it's one that I don't just have a debate over. I warn and I caution. Be very careful. This is a serious error. And my friend, it's love that causes me to urge you to go to God again, there's more to be learned. Go back to the plain sense of Scripture and be delivered from this error. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please uh, give him a hand for the participation. Uh, sorry we got off to a late start and time is late, but it would not really be a complete debate if we didn't have at least a couple of questions from the audience so that uh, we can, you know, relate this to, to mm. ourselves. Uh, I want uh, at least uh, one or two questions asked to each person. So if you have a question, uh, would you please come up to the microphone and please direct it to uh, who it is that you want to answer the question, either Michael or Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever you direct your question to, the next question needs to be directed to the other participant, okay? So if the next person in line has a question for the same person, you need to defer to someone behind you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for both. Can I ask two questions? If not, it's okay. I can just do one. Just do one. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Sullivan, thank you for your presentation. I, I found, uh, well, the whole debate was fascinating. Um, I'm not... Uh, too acquainted with your position of full preterism. Um, so uh, on 
On that, I, I hope I'm not misrepresenting your position, and, and if I am, you can clarify. Um, but uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And it is my understanding that the preter full preterist view basically says that Satan's already out of the equation. The, you know, that he's, he's done away with, you know, he's, he's already been judged. Uh, we don't really have to worry about Satan anymore. But wouldn't that mean that some scripture is not profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction and training in righteousness? Like, like the scriptures in 1 Peter 5, 8, which tells us to be on guard because Satan roar, prowls around like a roaring lion. And, and James 4, like with, Dr. Brown brought up earlier about resisting the devil. Do, do those scriptures have no relevance to us? And if so, how do you reconcile that with? Sure. First of all, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, when Dr. Brown talks about James and Peter, he's not honor, honoring audience relevancy. So, yeah, Satan would be crushed shortly in their near future. So when he appeals to Peter, which is still before AD 70, we'll see, he was still a roaring lion that disproves his position. That didn't disprove my position because he was active and the demonic was active during that time. I can't remember if it's Zechariah or Zephaniah that talks about um, the unclean spirit would be driven from the land. And that's, that's what Jesus does in the second Exodus. He's coming in to the land and he's cleansing it and then in AD 70, when he comes, he judges Satan and he judges the, the demons. And um, that's all a part of Revelation 1. It says these things will, will take place shortly. As far as the scripture being profitable, it's still profitable. We don't need to be battling Satan for it not to be profitable. So. Yeah, so your, your point is well taken. These verses become completely irrelevant. And it's very similar to a, to a cult-like reading of scripture like Jehovah's Witnesses do where you show all the verses about we have assurance of salvation and things like that, and they say, no, that, that doesn't apply to us. That was just for the 144,000. So, of course, Satan's still active. There's been no change from before 70 AD to after in that respect. And, of course, those words are 100% relevant, as your question was. Hello, Dr. Brown. Hey. Uh, this one's for you, buddy. Um, so I just wanted to know how, I guess I, I kind of heard you touch on it, you were going to Mr. Sullivan here, and you were talking about how uh, he, the way he takes uh, things talking about the physical body and then how he kind of handles that. And you said, you know, he wasn't answering your question. I guess the question I'd like to ask is how do you handle the Greek word mellow in talking about the soon, quickly, shortly coming of Christ? And then again in Revelation 1, when he's talking about, uh, I can't remember the script off the top of my head, but he's saying um, that he's coming soon. Uh, and when you take a look at the time text, it just, it's really, this has kind of always been my thing. You look at the time, you realize the time, and then it's like, well, how else could God, like, describe his second coming? Yeah, so he could very easily just give a date. It has to happen before this. For example, Daniel 9 makes clear that the Messiah has to do various things before the second temple is destroyed. So you have just what's called the terminus ad quem. Very easy to, to do that. We also know that some of this language in speak scholars would verify can refer to the manner, so swiftly, suddenly. And then it's very common in other apocalyptic literature, something soon, it's right at the door. And, and as I said, I could give you Old Testament prophecies where something, uh, they say this is about to come to pass, this is at the door, it's imminent, and it's, it's actually generations, in some cases hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then we have Jesus talking about it that his return, people are going to think he's delayed his coming and it's not going to happen. In 2 Peter 3, scoffers, where, where Peter says, hey, God's timetable is different. So amazingly, God has worked things out in such a way that every generation has lived with that sense of imminence and at the door. And in each generation, God is acting and he is doing certain things. And remember Revelation 2 and 3, that's also directed to the churches in Asia Minor there with direct application. Uh, so... Number one, God could have just given dates. He could have given a number of years, like we have in Isaiah 7. He gives a number of years within which a certain thing will, will happen. Uh, but to use that language as it's used elsewhere in the Bible, speaks could be of swiftly, suddenly, or something right at the door. And we have that language throughout Scripture. Um, there's direct application, he says, to Christ coming soon and quickly to the seven churches in Asia, 
Absolutely not. Just like in 2 Thessalonians 1, when the Thessalonians were promised relief from their persecutors at the coming of Christ, he doesn't say, oh, well, your relief's going to come when you die, and then 2,000 plus years later, then the second coming somehow will apply to your relief from these persecutors. No, in, in Revelation, they are in the tribulation. They are going to um, receive relief at the soon coming. I mean, is this like carrot and stick theology, eschatology? You know, and, you know, Second Peter 3, if you go to a hermeneutics class, any hermeneutics class, I don't care what denomination, and you ask the prophet question, if I've got 150 clear statements in Scripture, but I've got one verse over here that seems to say something different. What, which one do I go with? You go with the hundred and clear. Now, I established from the Old Testament that near means near and that it was serious when people changed the meaning of near. I established from the Old Testament as well of apocalyptic language, stars falling from the heavens, the heavens being rolled back. This was not understood physically. So I believe that the apocalypse I'm sorry, I don't know what the time is. You just have to it's say. supposed to be yeah, two minutes and one. Sorry, I, I don't know. But just, just to add in, I read all the plain scriptures that are so plain, so obvious, so clear, that that establishes the meaning, and you can't spiritualize those away. And again, you've established many things in the Old Testament that were imminent at the door, don't, don't get fulfilled for many, many centuries, and some we're still waiting for. Thank you, guys. Thanks. What, which ones? Uh, my question is for you, Dr. Sullivan, and um, my question is Revelation 22, verse 5. And there will no longer be any night, so I guess this is day, I don't know. Um, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun. So I would also ask, like, why are these lights on? We don't need them. And then there will be no need for the light of the sun, so... When the sun shines, we don't really need that to see um, because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. It clearly says they will don't need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun. Right, because Jesus is the light of the world. Paul says that Christ in you is the hope of glory. In Romans, he says that that glory was about to be revealed in the church. Go through the Gospel of John. Go through the Gospels, and I want you to circle every time the word in is used in relationship to Jesus' kingdom. The idea is his presence being within his people. So if he's the light of the world, we're the new Jerusalem. And when he says the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 16 is a perfect cube, what do you think he's communicating there? The most holy place in the temple was a perfect cube. He's saying that God's people, the new Jerusalem, I'm going to dwell within you and I'm going to take away your sin and I'm going to be your light and your life. So no, I, I don't take that literally. So just because it's dark outside doesn't necessarily um, make the case. And so in other words, everybody go out of here and be really depressed because this is it. This is it. This is the new heavens. This is the new earth. This is everything that has been promised. It doesn't get any better than this. When you watch people wither away and die, it doesn't get any better than this. When you watch natural disasters and thousands of people wiped out, it doesn't get any better than this. When you hear about a 15-year-old committing suicide out of depression, it doesn't get any better than this. We're already in the new heavens and the new earth. Interestingly, Jesus was the light of the world, and we were in him and he was in us before 70 AD. So what changed then if it's all just spiritual language? Thank God. Thank God Jesus has not yet returned. We are not yet in the new heavens and the new earth and the resurrection is still ahead. Otherwise, friends, we are in the worst nightmare in history. Uh, just by the way, quick interruption there on 2 Corinthians 5.17. He's actually quoting... Isaiah 65, 17, when he says that we're a new creation, all things have passed away, behold, all things are new. We're the new creation. The light of Christ is in us. Yeah, we are a new creation, and thank God there will be a new heavens and a new earth without sin, without mourning, without pain, without death. And if God can't be trusted, throw the whole Bible out. Thanks for your question, buddy.
So I guess my questions for Dr. Brown, um, I was just hoping you could clear something up. Um, you've been talking through Revelation apocalyptic literature, and I don't really know how to ask this as one question. You just kind of, you know, obviously, a uh, yes or no question would be, is, it, is Revelation a prophetic book? In which case, my real question would be, when was it written? Because the basis of this debate was that prophecy ceased after 70 AD when the perfect supposedly came. But I haven't done a lot of research, but I haven't seen any arguments that put the authorship of Revelation before 70 AD. So there, there's been, even though my own view is that it was written towards the end of the first century, or the towards the end of the Grand Commission, um, there's debate about it, and I'm not going to hang my hat on it. There have been scholars of, through history that have put it to an earlier date. There's different testimony from church leaders. I believe the best scholarship indicates a date at the end of the first century, but I didn't raise that tonight because that, that to me is, is something that we're not going to be able to prove either way. So for Michael's position to be true, Revelation has to be written before the year 70. But that wouldn't trouble me if that was the case. I don't believe that's the case, but it wouldn't trouble me whatsoever. If it was written afterwards, then of course, the whole, all the argument that's being raised is 100% rebutted before we start. But I didn't focus on that because that's something we could just debate either way. I wanted to focus on what was really non-debatable. Uh, very good question, by the way. Um, if you can get a book, it's called Before Jerusalem Fell, written by Kenneth Gentry. It's about this thick. It goes through just that issue alone. Very scholarly, but it's very easy reading too. All right, so I'd recommend that. Point number one. Point number two, it's interesting that even liberal scholars now are starting to acknowledge that the entire New Testament was written before AD 70. And that's, that's a very powerful uh, you know, explanation or, or validation of the scriptures. And the reason I say that and they say that, they admit this, is because there wouldn't have been another his, more important historic event than the destruction of the temple. The t destruction of the temple, or the temple itself, was their world. Everything, their civil laws, their ceremonial laws, everything was connected to that temple. So if you have a document that's written after that event, that document would specify that. But what we have in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 11, is an anticipation of the treading down of that temple. And it's interesting that that is that city in Revelation, that harlot Babylon, is where the Lord was slain. That's Jerusalem. That's not Iran. That's not Iraq. That's not a Mecca. The text tells you. And when that city was judged is when everything unfolds. Revelation is John's version of the Olivet Discourse. My brother said, oh, I could take AD 70 and, and John, or uh, Matthew 24. Well, if you do that, you have to do it in Revelation. Yeah, and just, that's just a problem with yeah, Sam's just storm. Been, uh, I was talking about one particular verse, not all of Matthew 24. You're talking about the coming of the Lord? One Matthew particular verse. Like, Which one? I, around verse 27, the coming of the Son. But, but either oh, way, that's, 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 that, right. that's, that's not my view there. But again, the vast majority of Revelation scholars host believe it's written at the end of the first century. Based so on a statement by after, Arne, Arne long, 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 after, totally long after the destruction of, of Jerusalem, just for the record. Okay, for the sake of time, let's uh, let these last two uh, people ask the question and then we will close off. So my question is from Mr. Sullivan. Yes, In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 all the way down to 19 are a lot of this argument altogether. It is about the resurrection. This is when Paul is refuting those that are saying the resurrection has already passed. Um, for time's sake, I just want to read the fact, the last four, 16 and 19. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our faith is worthless. You are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. There's about four different questions that I would love to ask out of this passage, <laughs> particularly to you. But I'm only going to focus on one. If you're saying that the resurrection has already passed, it's all over with and it's all done, I want to know specifically what are you hoping for? 
What is the hope that you have for the future? Christ in you is the hope of glory. My hope is realized. Uh, Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Uh, in Hebrews 10, 37, that hope would not be delayed. Michael Brown's got a hope that's 2,000 plus years delayed. So Christ is my hope, number one. As far as 1 Corinthians 15, oh, man, that, that's, that's a long uh, answer to that, bro. Um, I've got an article on fullpreterism.com, which is a complete exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15. We also have an exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15 in my book back there, uh, written by David Green. You're more than welcome to that. But uh, long story short, it's interesting. If you follow Paul's modus tollens argument, he assumes that the resurrection deniers did not have a false hope. They believed that Jesus was raised because he argues that. And so they were denying the resurrection for a certain group, the dead, but they weren't denying the resurrection for those who were in Christ. So what they were basically saying is those who had died before Christ, they're, they're ceased, they're gone. But we believe that we have a hope in Christ and we believe that those who died in Christ will be raised. It's similar to a view in the Old Testament where the, some Jews denied resurrection for those outside the land. Now, some Jews felt that, you know, they would tunnel and, and pop up in the land. But some of them said, if you died outside the land, you will not never be raised. I think we, we have, that's what we have in, Resur in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We have the Gentiles saying, you know, you guys that died before Christ in the new covenant, they're gone. We're it. It was a, a pre-replacement of sorts. Yeah, so once again, you have the obvious meaning of the verses, as you said, that they were denying a literal physical resurrection in the future and has to be twisted to mean something nobody ever would have dreamed of that Paul was writing to, to come up with this answer again, to be candid. And of course, it's a very serious thing. Paul was teaching the exact opposite. He was warning against what our brother was teaching tonight. I, I take that seriously when, when Paul warns us. Okay, and in Christ is the first fruits. Messiah is the first fruits. He is the first fruits to rise. Others will physically rise. So we have to, here's what we have. We have the wonderful, glorious, intimate relationship with God, full of the spirit, communion with him day by day, which is more than we could ever ask for or imagine. Then when Jesus returns, if we physically die, we'll be resurrected in glorious bodies. If we're alive, we'll be transformed and then we'll be with him forever and ever and ever, in a place where literally there's no mourning, no sighing, no death, and you don't have to be told that the mourning, sighing, death really aren't mourning, sighing, death, and that the darkness and destruction really aren't darkness and destruction, where there really won't be darkness, destruction, or mourning, sorrow, death. So I go with Paul, always. I go with Paul. At, at some point, can I have about 30 or 45 seconds to address Hymenaeus and Philetus at some point? If it, that's a question that comes up. <laughs> Otherwise, you're written about it. it's in your book. It is in my book. Go ahead. That's the last question. Uh, what was that question you were looking for? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. I planned it. No. Uh, this, this question is for you, Dr. Brown. Um, and it's kind of abstract in a sense. If you could go back in time to when uh, Mr. Sullivan was going through, you know, wondering whether speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit were authentic. Um, and you could help challenge and encourage him, what would you do? Um, what would you say to uh, Mr. Sultan? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a wonderful question. And since you're sitting here, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't question your sincerity. I don't question the difficult choices you've made to come to certain conclusions. I don't question that you believe scriptures come alive to you in these different ways and now it all fits together to the point you're willing to throw out things for, for thousands of years doesn't, doesn't matter. But I would have told you, okay, first thing, let's forget about experience. Let's just look at the Word, look at the Word, look at the Word. If we don't see anybody healed, if we don't see miracles, to, what does the Word say? That would be the first thing that, that I would have said we have to do. And then second thing, if, if you're still struggling with questions, I'd say, well, let's look into documented miracles. Let's look at the real evidence. You're wondering why it's not here. Well, God's doing these things all over. Let's go to certain places where these things are happening on a regular basis. Let's interview the people. Let's interview the doctors. Let's look at the medically supported 
testimony. So not only do you have the testimony of the word, but now you have the ongoing encouragement that God, in fact, is doing these wonderful things. And you don't have to change your theology. And then the whole word talks about spiritual hunger and spiritual desperation. And that, you know, that's just the theme throughout the Bible, the longing, the crying out, the wanting to see God move and deliver his people. Because we're in a hurting, broken world, Romans 8, that we're still growing and travailing because the world is hurting and suffering. So I'd say, let's, let's go after God together. You want to stay up all night and pray? Let's do it. You want to fast? Then let's do it because there's going to be a breakthrough and God's going to honor his word. As surely as he's God, he's going to honor his word. So I say, first, we, we just look at the word. Second, be encouraged by the good things God is doing. And third, let's partner together to pray and cry out to God until the breakthrough comes. And I know someone that it took months and months and months of praying 10, 12 hours a day before God met them. And they've been changed forever. But he, he does fill the hungry and he does satisfy the thirsty. So the story's not over, sir. We're still believing for another new chapter. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and since you, you said that I misrepresented you so much, I felt I was a little bit represented, misrepresented when you said that, uh, see, he admitted he was looking for a way out. Uh, actually, that isn't completely what I said. I said that I went to the well, master's those college. Those words. Did I say that you were looking yeah, for a way out? Yeah, you, you kind of said I? I was based on experience. No, I, yeah, yeah, I said that, yeah, I didn't say you were looking for a way out. Okay, well, maybe I misunderstood. But either way, my, my, my point was is that when I went to the master's college, I was an educated charismatic. I had four main arguments that were my pillars that are the same exegetical arguments that you present in your book. And those were, and if Pastor MacArthur remembers me as a student, he would remember me, you know, walking with him, just badgering him about limited atonement and this particular issue. And he helped me with, when tongues were spoken in the Bible, it was a known foreign language. I don't buy the tongues of angels. We can definitely get into that another time. Um, and when he talked, when prophecy was done in the New Testament, it was infallible. Dr. Brown has redefined the meaning of tongues, the meaning of prophecy, that it can be fallible. Sam Storms actually argues that with Agabus. But I don't think Dr. Brown would help me because I was sitting under John Wimber. I mean, I was sitting in where all the action was supposed to be. And I was laying my hands on the people in the wheelchairs when everyone else was talking about back pain. There was something that was really going on here or that wasn't going on and that I needed answers for. And I did fast, and I don't want to you know, boast or anything about that, but I did fast and I did pray about eschatology because I wanted to be more clear on that and this particular issue. And preterism just dropped in my lap within Reformed theology. And I started looking at it and looking at it, and I saw those parallels between First Thessalonians 4 and the Olivet Discourse, and I said... Either there is no coming of Christ in Matthew 24 and it's all future, or if it happened in AD 70, then 1 Thessalonians 4 was. And, and I, I, I said, this is what I believe. I thought I was the only one in the world that believed this. And then, no, there's, there's a lot of people actually that believe this. Steve, would you allow just one question just to clarify? what? Because I, I don't know if we're clear on this. If it's since you're the moderator. Okay. With that. okay. Um, what happens to you when you die? When I die? Yeah. Okay, so before AD 70, where do people go when they die? Uh, I believe they went to Abraham's bosom. They went to a place of waiting. They went to Hades. So in AD 70, um, remember what Daniel is told in Daniel 12. He says, seal up the, the vision. You're going to die, and you're going to rise in the end, right? And then John is told the exact opposite. He says, he says, don't seal up the vision for the time is at hand. So Dr. Brown would say, seal up the vision. No, no, far. What, what, what I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Really but, but Daniel was raised when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. He was raised in God's presence. And this is an orthodox position that Hades was opened in 87. What happens to you when you die? It's really I go into directly into God's presence. Oh, okay. I continue to enjoy Him. Forever. Okay, so you leave this world, you leave the new heavens and the new earth, and you go somewhere else. I am. I'm in God's kingdom, and I continue, and I'm in His presence, and I but continue. But you go somewhere else. I continue in His presence without my physical body. But somewhere else, not walking around like a ghost here. I so go I'm into the spiritual realm, unseen realm, as your friend Doctor. Okay, Heisen. so then ultimately, there's nobody left on the earth, then, right? You know, well, I would be on the earth. 
Yeah. Right, go on. Okay. Anyway, just <laughs> just want to get clarity on that. Good. Thank you. That helps. All right. May we all be in the Lord's presence someday. Thank you both for participating. Uh, again, let's uh, give them thanks right. for supporting us on these issues.